So let's talk about resistance. So resistance is a really big topic. I think of all the different things we talk to our trainees about, the one that um, incites the most fear and spikes in cortisol levels is resistance because it seems complicated. <clears throat> there's science involved and then there's numbers. Um, and even though we're medical and science minded, when you have this kind of basic cellular biology and virology and math or numbers, it okay. freaks people out. So let's yeah. try to demystify it a bit. Me too. And, oh. um, yeah, and, and people should probably try to mute if they could okay. remember to do that because I know we're all busy and there's okay. dogs and overhead paging and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to move forward. Let's see if I can do it. There we go. So um, just, just basically, let me just make sure. So just some basics about um, why this is a big deal in HIV. Um, it's a big deal for most viruses, and viruses are pretty simple. They're not complicated like bacteria, which are much, much, much more complicated and much more um, complex organisms. And of course, nothing like you know, terrestrial organisms like us. Um, so these are pretty simple packages of genetic information that is very rudimentary. Um, and when they, when they do what they do, they de definitely don't have to reproduce in a faithful manner because you know, viruses can kind of get away with a lot of, of leeway as far as mutations. Us, on the other hand, you know, it doesn't take too many bad mutations and you don't have a baby. Um, so we have to think about viruses being able to, to replicate sloppily. And when a virus replicates sloppily, it means that just by chance, you can get some pretty bad mutations. And rather than not letting that virus go ahead and make more virus, um, it could be carried on. And so there's a lot of um, you know, um, replication that produces progeny virus that looks different than the parent virus. And that's important for us because just by random chance, when you have so many billions of virions created in an infected person, even if you have a one in a million chance that you're going to get, let's say, an AZT mutation, it's guaranteed to happen if you have billions of viruses being produced every day. So picture for your, in your mind that there's lots of virus, it's replicating, not very faithfully, and there's going to be just some mutations that occur just naturally. So when you apply HIV therapy, it's basically like applying um, you know, an environmental factor that's shifting the viral evolution in a particular direction. So we talk a lot about global warming. So, you know, global warming on our planet or climate change is going to shift evolution of certain organisms because some organisms are better able to handle those shifts than others. So same thing here. When you apply HIV therapy, if you have great HIV therapy adherence, and you have the right drugs and they're getting where they need to go, there's not gonna be an opportunity for mutations, resistance mutations to develop because there's no replication. No replication, no mutant baby virus, okay? So if, you, if, you, if a population of people don't replicate, then they're not gonna have mutant babies. Same thing for HIV. And antivirals are not, you know, RAID. We always say it doesn't kill HIV on contact. It's birth control for the virus. So when we take HIV therapy, we're decreasing replication, and thus the rate of mutations has got to go down because the replications go down. However, if you don't take the medication correctly or you're not absorbing it or whatever, and you get levels of antiviral medication that allow some virus to replicate, you're begging that virus to make mutations and if there happen to be any virus that already just by chance has some advantage that can live in the face of low levels of the drug, it's going to be selected for. So we'll talk more about that because that's it's kind of complicated. So this summarizes basic ideas. There's low fidelity when HIV makes copies of itself. Mistakes, i.e. mutations occur leading to resistant strains. Most of these don't cause trouble but some of these could with our HIV therapies. And if you take antiretroviral therapy in a suboptimal manner, you're going to be selecting for resistance mutations. So here's one illustration. So if you have an anti-HIV drug 
and you're taking it the right way, you would see here that the green virus here, these are HIV variants that are susceptible to the drug, the drug is gonna work. But if you have variants that are not susceptible to the drug, the drug is not gonna work and you're gonna get a big population of these guys growing, these guys won't. So you're selecting for these guys. If you stop this drug, you're gonna get back to purple, orange, and green. You're gonna have all these guys. But once you apply the drug, you're killing the susceptible, but you're allowing, in fact, promoting the growth of these guys who no longer have to compete with the susceptible drug, the susceptible virus. So this is this analogy that I've used before. Some of you have seen it, so just bear with me. But you know, when I describe it to folks, it's sort of like corn. So imagine that this is corn in a field, um, and you know, it just grows, it just like virus grows. And then let's call this corn wild type, because this is the kind that just grows in nature. Okay, someone sprays this corn with Roundup. You would be like, that's the worst thing in the world to do for corn, because Roundup's a weed killer. It's gonna kill the corn. So there's the Roundup being sprayed, and that's what's left, right? The corn dies. Okay, so in this analogy, think of corn as the virus, um, and the Roundup as our HIV therapy. And, and this is actually what we would want. Okay. But what if we modified the corn to make it genetically resistant to Roundup? Okay. And then we go and spray with Roundup. Well, the corn is going to survive, right? Because it's resistant to the Roundup. But what if you don't spray Roundup anymore? If you keep spraying Roundup, you know, you're just going to get Roundup resistant corn. But let's say you leave the field alone for three years. What you're going to get is kind of a mixture. There's no advantage of Roundup resistant corn if there's no Roundup. When there's Roundup around, corn that's resistant to Roundup is going to grow. But when it's not around, maybe just the regular corn would grow. And if there's any sort of downside to Roundup resistant corn. If Roundup resistant corn doesn't grow as well as regular corn for some reason, the corn that evolution created to grow naturally, actually you might find very little Roundup resistant corn um, and you'd find a lot of wild type. And that's basically what we're talking about here. So here again, the corn is HIV and you have wild type or resistant. And it does turn out that some of our resistant viruses can't compete very well against wild type. And that may explain, that does explain, why when you stop HIV medicine, you see a real decrease in the resistant strains such that you may not even see them on our testing. They're still there, hiding in the soil, waiting for when you spray the Roundup or give the HIV therapy. But the wild type has an advantage evolutionarily, and you find the wild type. So hopefully that helps explain it. I'm not going to get too much into this because this is less of an issue than it used to be, but there's two basic ways that we look for resistance. One is called genotype, one is called phenotype. Almost always we're looking at genotypes. They're cheaper, they're easier. They look for the actual mutations in the virus that confer resistance. And there's a way to do this based upon consensus virus, meaning we know what wild type viruses' genes look like. And when we compare the virus from your patient to the consensus virus, we can see where there's differences. It doesn't get every last little species, so you could have resistant virus there in a low percentage of the population, and it could be missed, okay? So here in Chapel Hill, we are an incredibly blue town, not a red town. That doesn't mean if you did a survey of 500 people, you know, you wouldn't find everyone is Democrat. There may be a Republican in there, but with only 500 people, you may not even find one Republican. But if you surveyed 5,000 people, you would find more. Resistance testing with genotypes are looking for the majority populations. Minority species may not be well represented. Phenotype's a little different. Phenotype is almost like what we do when you look at your MRSA in your hospital and see how much resistance is there to methicillin or vancomycin. It's looking how much drug actually is needed to, to decrease replication of that particular organism. So the genotypic resistance is what we use. It's easier, it's faster, it's cheaper. And what you can see here is, is a codon. Remember, I know it's, it's scary, science is scary, but you know we have these templates and these amino acids code for, I mean, these genes code for an amino acid. And when there's a replication that leads to a mutation, you can have a switch in the amino acid based upon this position here being swapped from a G to an A. 
Um, and sometimes you have switches that don't make a difference, but sometimes you have a mutation that does. This is what we're talking about when we talk like a M184V. You know, the M switched to 184 spot to a V. This is exactly what this is talking about. So here is a typical sort of genotype. I just got this from a patient of mine just about a month ago. And you can see, you know, she has a bunch of different mutations and they're listed here. And we know based upon comparing these mutations to wild type virus that she has resistance, that this virus is just not going to be susceptible to the drug um, based upon the changes that this virus has gone through over time. Now, isusa.org, so ISA USA is a great organization, and they have produced these wonderful um, printouts. You can go to their website. You carry them in your pocket. They have laminated versions that I think you could get for free. Um, and, and I'm not going to go into it, but they list the different types of mutations and what happens to the drug. So you might have, just like in the case we had just now, you might be able to see it's really you know, little on mine, but here's the M184V right here. So at the 184 position, an M switching to a V or an I leads to resistance to this drug, which is FTC. You can see here it also inhibits a back of ear to some degree and 3TC. So you can see it's across the line for those three. And that's what you could do for all these things. If that's too complicated and you really like computer-based um, toys, you can do this. You can plug in to the Stanford um, University HIV drug resistance database your mutations that you get from your genotype. They'll show you right here. You'll plug it down. You'll go 184, um, and it'll be right here, and you'll click in a V, um, and you'll have other ones. And then you hit analyze, and it tells you the susceptibility of the virus predicted to the drugs that are available to treat HIV. Phenotypic testing is much more complicated. I'm not going to get into it. It's here for you who really care about it, but it looks again at how much drug it takes to shift um, a virus to being suppressed. If it takes more drug to pour on top of the virus to get it to stop replicating, the virus is getting increasingly resistant. When do we order resistance tests? Um, basically, in people who are failing their therapy or people who are naive to therapy. Um, and we do it in the naive situation because some people can acquire resistant virus. We do it in the experienced patient whose virus is rebounding. So we can see which, which drugs the person's taking, um, the person has, has developed resistance to, and then we can make treatment decisions. So this is really cool. From the Stanford database, they have a very nice map of kind of where resistance is in treatment naive patients. So these are people who've never, ever, ever had HIV therapy. And if you look at the proportion of those folks who have drug resistance, any major drug resistance to any ART, you get a darker shading and a bigger circle. So the percent of resistance is over 10% in the dark circles. So this is all over the world. So in Australia, you're seeing less here because um, there's limited drugs and limited use of drugs. But in the United States and in Europe, you're seeing a lot of resistance because we have a lot of people on medicines. Some of those people develop resistance and then transmit that resistance to other people. I'll show you data about the United States a little closer in a second. So let's go through some cases, and I know that we have a case to go over as well, but this is just to illustrate a couple of points. These are not like we should really think hard about these. But let me give you an illustration here. So a 34-year-old guy, he's newly diagnosed with HIV. He has a long-term HIV-positive partner. And four months ago, he says, yeah, I, you know, I had a severe viral illness. I was in bed. His partner, who's been suppressed for therapy on years, stopped therapy after these guys moved to North Carolina. He didn't enter ADAP. He missed the deadline. There was a delay in his getting therapy. And so, I, you know, obviously, the person probably became viremic when he stopped his therapy. Our patient comes in, he's got a T cell count of 600, it's confirmed, his viral load's high at 165,000. His hepatitis B and C negative, creatinine's fine, ALT's fine. And he says, you know, what do I do? And you say, I think you should start on therapy, and he's agreeable to start on therapy. So question is, and you should unmute by now, you know, what tests would you want? You know, guy's coming in, he's newly diagnosed, you know his viral load is CD4, you know his chem panel. Are there any other things that you would want right now based upon what I just told you? <laughs> Don't be shy. 
He needs a genotype. Get a genotype. Right. Okay. So he gets a genotype and his resistance test is a K103N. And a mutation. So a K103N, if you've got that nifty difty handout, it would show you that when you have a mutation at the 103 position, and it's this, this classic K switching to an N, you have resistance to afavrans and nivirapine. So almost certainly his partner was on afavrans. And the 215 mutation is kind of squirrely. This is a position where we see this disease mutation. Um, and so that could be a mutation that reflects his partner's prior treatment, maybe with AZT or something like that, or maybe he got infected with a resistance mutation. So yeah, so it's showing that this guy has acquired resistance. Let's see if I can make this happen. So then the question is, like a patient like this, we have to think hard about like what would we give this person? So would we give him a Favrans-based regimen? You know, no, we wouldn't because he's resistant to a Favrans already, even though he's never seen the drug. Um, and I'll go through these just to save time. What about ropivirine and tenofovir and FTC? You could because there's data that shows ropivirine, which is in the same class as a Favrans, can work in people who have um, a K103. I would be a little concerned in this case for those of you who are really into this stuff about the 215 and maybe tenofovir wouldn't work as well. But by and large, that should work too if this is the right drug for the person. Same thing, boosted protease inhibitors, whether darunavir or atazanavir, should work fine. Um, uh, l vitegravir cobi um, Strybilds combination should work fine. Um, these guys, other integrase inhibitors with tenofovir FTC. A back of your 3TC diotegravir, I'd be worried about. Um, you know, again, it could work. It shouldn't be a problem, but that 215 could confer some resistance to a back of your, so be a little bit less sanguine about this. Um, but, and this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but the point is you wouldn't want to use an efavirenz-based regimen. So here's the United States. You can see where we have pockets of um, resistance. There's not a lot, a lot of data from the South, but in North Carolina, we have some data and it shows that we are about the same. It looks like about 10 to 15% of people coming in with HIV have at least one major mutation. And it's in about half those people, it's mutation to efavirenz. So about 5% to 10% of people coming in, efavirenz will not work. And these, these are the data from North Carolina. You can see the line is going up over time and that we're seeing in acutely infected or recent infected people, you're seeing resistance and this is transmitted resistance in about you know, close to 20% of those with acute HIV infection. Most of this again is nucleoside and non-nucleoside resistance. And we do have other studies, I'm not gonna go into like complicated charts, but we do have studies that show that when you don't have transmitted resistance, um, the chance of getting virologic failure is really low. But if you have transmitted resistance um, and you're on a drug that doesn't work based upon that mutation, lo and behold, you have a higher rate of virologic failure. And if it's kind of partial, um, you get you know, more response. Um, and when you get you know, activity uh, with your regimen against all the virus you've got, all the drugs work, you get much better responses. So it, it kind of goes in the duck category, but it, it needed data to show it, and it does, it does pan out. That if you have transmitted drug resistance, you cannot use drugs that your virus is resistant to. So quickly, another one. This is a 55-year-old woman on HIV therapy for five years. She's on atazanavir, ritonavir, and Truvada. She lost her insurance six months ago, and her copay um, on her new insurance increased from $20 um, to $120 a month. And it has to do with how many bottles she has. So she has three bottles, right? She's got her Truvada, her Rayataz, and her Norbier. So she now has to pay you know, per bottle. She's rationed her ART over two months, which is a big no-no. We tell people if you're going to stop, stop cold turkey. And now she's off for one month. What additional tests would you like to order? Um, here's her CD4 cell count. Now it's 386. Six months ago it was 512. Her viral load now is 42,000. Last visit it was less than 40. And so what will the genotype show? What do you predict? She's been off of therapy for a month. Before that, she was on Rayataz, Norvir, Truvada. She kind of rationed her therapy, though, before stopping. What do you expect to see in her genotype? 
Possibly nothing. Nothing. Right. You said it. Nothing. It's likely to show nothing. And why is it going to show nothing? You've been off the meds for a full month. Right. Right. So does that mean she may have gotten resistance, maybe to her tenofovir or maybe to her FTC? Does that mean her resistance is gone? No. It's not show. Sure. Right. It's it's the Roundup resistant virus is, to, is is being overgrown by the wild type virus. So her regular virus is just going to pop back up because the resistant virus doesn't need to be there. There's no selective pressure. If you go back on the drugs, that's when you might find a virus that is resistant. The so caveats to remember: mutations can disappear. But they're not really gone if testing is delayed after stopping therapy. And that's because the mutants could be overgrown by the wild type virus. So it's best to actually look for resistance when people are on the, their ART. If she came in and said, no, I'm taking my meds, I'm taking my meds, and her virus is 42,000, and you get a genotype and it's completely, completely negative, there's no resistance, it's really a polygraph. It really shows you she's lying. Because there's no way you're going to get, you know, no mutations and 42,000 virus while being on your medicine. Okay. Mutations are never gone, at least for HIV. This is not true for hepatitis C, but for HIV, mutations that are there are archived. That virus is somewhere hidden inside the body, and all you got to do is put them back on the selective medicine, and you'll find that virus. So we like to stop a regimen that's failing because if you keep them on a failing regimen, you could cultivate more and more mutations and that could burn other drugs. So in this lady's case, you know, what would we do? So we could put her on a new regimen. We don't have any resistance testing and you could say, well, you were on that and you kind of messed it up and maybe we should put you on something like this, like Complera, because it's one pill. Um, and your copay would be reduced, you know, hopefully down to a third. Or you could put her on a boosted PI plus her Truvada, or a boosted PI plus maybe a different combination because you're worried she's resistant to this, but I'm not sure that that would help, or something else or some sort of wacky. To get to the bottom line, I think in this kind of case, what I would do is I would put her on her old regimen. I'd put her back on Tenofovir FTC and her boosted Atazanavir, um, if, if she could afford it. In this case, I might say to her, well, you know, there's a new formulation of boosted PI with, with Cobicistat, and that would get you down to two pills, you know, or to two copays. And I'd also work on her copays and her copay card. We try to solve her financial situation that led to this. But I'll tell you why I put her back on a boosted protease inhibitor and her tenofovir and FTC. And that's because of this. When you look at study after study after study of boosted PIs, and people who are failing in these studies, the number of PI mutations you find is basically zero. There is something magical that we don't completely understand about boosted PIs that make it very, very hard, even if you're failing the therapy, to get mutations. And it has to do with you really need a series of mutations to lead to a decrease in susceptibility to protease inhibitors that are boosted, whether by cobicistat or ritonavir. And the same thing is not true for NNRTIs. It doesn't take very much at all if you're failing a favorans to get mutations. So we talk about genetic barrier to resistance, and the genetic barrier to resistance for boosted PIs is really, really high. The genetic barrier to resistance to favorans is really, really low. Same thing for FTC and 3TC. The integrase inhibitors may be in between. So here's a really interesting study of dolutegravir in treatment-naive patients compared to a Favrans. And when you look at people who fail, and there's not too many who do, these are very effective regimens, but when they fail, in the Favrans arm, like we said, you get some mutations detected. But in the dolutegravir arm, we didn't see any. And dolutegravir is acting maybe a little bit more like a protease inhibitor. When you look at L-vitegravir, this is a study of L-vitegravir. It doesn't matter which arm you're looking at because this is just what it's um, partnered with. 
This is Strybild in orange versus a new type of Strybild with a new type of tenofovir. But the bottom line here as well is you do see some resistance in the few people who fail. Whereas with the boosted protein inhibitor, it would, these would be zeros. And maybe with dalutegravir, we'd see more ones or zeros here too. So we see this gradation all the way from boosted protein inhibitor, maybe to dalutegravir, maybe to other integrase inhibitors, all the way down to the non-nucleosides. So again, this is what these things look like with the IAS USA. And we can see that with dalutegravir, you get some different mutations compared to the other integrase inhibitors. Um, and that may also be important as we sequence or think about using these drugs. So the last case, and then I'm going to open it up. Um, this is a patient who has seen, um, you know, who has been referred from another clinic, so was seen at another clinic and is referred to you. This person's been on a tripla for three years. That's her first regimen. Initial viral load was 12,000. She's had an undetectable HIV RNA until her last appointment, and now it's up to 6,500. Um, she says she's taking all of her medication. You get a genotypic resistance test, and it's got a K103N and a 184D. So that's important. So that she's got resistance to two out of her three medicines. The K103 hurts the efavirans, and the 184V is a signature mutation against 3TC and FTC, and it really inhibits both of those drugs from working. So you decide, of course, to change her regimen, and then we have to think about, well, what would we change to? And this is, this is often a challenge um, because we know that this person has some, some challenges here. So we'd have to work on adherence. If you can't tolerate or take a one pill a day, um, how well are you going to do on a multiple pill a day? So we have to think about that and really deconstruct it. But let's say, just say on paper, we just want to think about what feasibly biologically would work and what are the advantages and disadvantages. Well, we could think about atazanavir, ritonavir, or atazanavir, copecystat. That's a new formulation. Both of those are um, boosted PIs. This is nice because it's one pill a day, plus tenofovir FTC. So advantages are she'd be on two pills. You have this bulletproof against resistance combination. Um, the FTC in the Truvada, it won't work very well because we have that 184, but there's some data that show that tenofovir seems to work better than you'd expect um, when there's that 184B mutation around. That 184B may change the virus in a way that sensitizes it to tenofovir, at least in the laboratory. So we keep it on even though she's resistant or her virus is resistant to FTC, we would probably keep it on and it doesn't add any pill burden and it's very well tolerated. So this could be a good regimen. I'll tell you, I don't favor atazanavir as much as I do darunavir. I think darunavir is better tolerated um, and I think it's a little bit um, even better against resistance. So if I was going to put her on a boosted price inhibitor, I'd probably put her on darunavir and cobicistat one pill a day plus Truvada one pill a day. You could think about raltegravir. I generally wouldn't do it. With that 184V, that FTC, as I said, is a compromised drug. The tenofovir may be working you know, fully, if not a little bit more than fully, but raltegravir has a lower barrier to resistance. So I would be a little bit cautious. This is also twice a day, so that can complicate things. What about Strybil that has COBE? It's a booster. Is that making Elvitegravir like a boosted PI? No, it doesn't. Elvitegravir, as I showed you in that slide with the purple and orange, that Elvitegravir probably has a resistance barrier that's similar to Raltegravir. I would be worried about using this in this circumstance. Probably would work for most people, but I think the risk of not working is too high. Dalutegravir plus Truvada, it's, it's interesting, possibly. Again, there may be something different about Dalutegravir that might work. I would not use Triumec, which is Dalutegravir back of your 3TC. That 184B certainly knocks out the 3TC. A back of your is not hypersensitized by that mutation. In fact, it does take a little bite out of a back of your too. So I would not do that. Could she be on a boosted PI plus Raltegravir? could, again, raltegravir is twice a day. So I think I would still favor something like A or B and probably B as being my best chance to suppress her virus with a powerful drug. And if she messed it up, it wouldn't cause too much trouble. And it is two pills once a day, but she doesn't have to take it at night. So I think that might be a big you know, help for somebody um, if they don't have that nighttime dosing like they do of a triple. And there are data, I'm not going to go into that shows that even with a 184B, so you have resistance to 3TC or FTC. If you're on a boosted PI plus an NRTI, 
um, a nucleoside, it works in a majority of people. So overall, you know, conclusions are here. Resistance is important. We've got to test for um, resistance when it's appropriate. Certainly in naive patients, whether they're acute, whether they've been infected for 10 years, still worth to test it. Some mutations do stick around for a long time. That, that K103 I mentioned, that mutation can really stick around for a long time and you'd want to find it. Adherence is key. We have to really, we didn't talk about this, but resistance is really due to non-adherence in almost all the cases. And so really addressing adherence is just as important as figuring out what mutations mean and how to, how to deal with um, mutations with a new regimen.